Tak buat apa? Sembuh! As you can see, I'm Samoan. <laughs> I mean, what was I just doing? Because it really hurt. It, it really hurts. <laughs> now, to many of you, what I just did will look as if I slapped myself for no reason. But this is actually a part of a Samoan slap dance called Fa'a Tau Pati. As in many cultures, dance represents the people's everyday lives. Samoa is traditionally an oral culture. So its dances are used to draw children's interest about their society, um, and teach their everyday lives in the history of Samoa. What is interesting is that the Fa'a Tau Pati isn't used to teach this particular incident of Samoan history or how to slap mosquitoes in the Samoan way, but it's actually a macho boasting for men. At Kaiser High School, May Day, or as we call it, Lay Day, is a special occasion. Students perform various traditional Pacific Island dances during the school assembly, such as Samoan, Tahitian, and Hawaiian. So last year, one of my Samoan friends just dragged me into the Samoan dance group. And at that time, I knew nothing about the Samoans except that they lived somewhere in the middle of the Pacific in this tiny little island. And so my first impression about them were serious and intimidating because of their large profile and their coercive looking frowns. But the Samoans I met were actually joyful and warm and whose laughter were contagious. Now, our dance teacher calls the Samoans actually the happy people. And he's also Samoan, and he, he not only taught us the dance moves, but their origins and what they represent. We also had a chance to eat Samoan food like sapasui. So what I eventually learned was not how to catch mosquitoes in the Samoan way, or just to slap myself silly. It was a gist of a culture I had never known before. And I just joined the Samoan slap dance group for fun and my awe towards an exotic culture. However, as I spent more time with my Samoan friends, I realized that it wasn't just about entertainment. It was training to be tolerant about cultural diversity. And as most of you might have noticed by now, English is my second language. I, lived, uh, I came to Hawaii about two years ago from South Korea, and I also spent my elementary school years in Austin, Texas. But still, finding ways to accurately express myself in English is a challenge. But the real challenge was assimilating to the American culture. As I participate in the Samoan slap dance, I occasionally step into others' worlds in, to understand them and in hope of being accepted into their society. However, I am different. I am Korean. So for me to establish successful relationships with others, it's not just about them accepting me. As, I mean, it's not just about me being accepted as one of them. It's also them knowing who I am and where I come from. And this is how I label multicultural competence. And besides Samoan culture, there are American, Chinese, Hawaiian, uh, Japanese, Korean, Filipino, Portuguese, and many other cultures that commingle here in Hawaii. These cultures uh, required a common form of communication. Thus, Hawaiian pigeon was born. What fascinates me is how the plantation workers in the past instinctively knew that they needed to somehow blend, their, blend in their cultures. And as a multicultural citizen, I am inspired by this particular chapter of American multicultural history. In Korea, there is only one ethnicity, one culture. Therefore, a tendency towards consensus and a belief that there is only one answer. In school, only one interpretation in history or one interpretation in literature is considered as the one correct answer. So I have wondered whether such way of learning has prevented me from developing my own perspective about the world and has stalled me from understanding others who have different values, likes, dislikes, and passions that I have. Just recently, Time Magazine pointed out that it isn't only me who thinks that the Korean educational system obstructs student learning. Now, in the article, hey, teacher, leave those kids alone, we find that changes are underway in Korea. Even the current Korean president, Lee Myung-bak, vowed at his inauguration that a one-size-fits-all, government-led uniform curriculum and a college entrance exam, I mean, an education system that is locked only onto the college entrance exam, are not acceptable. But America wasn't like this from the very beginning. It used to be the melting pot of the world, which is making an average out of everyone and everything. It is where the tomato and carrot are labeled under one name, veggie soup. 
Oh, however, as um, immigrant families began to realize the importance of preserving their own cultural identity, the recent trend has shifted to the salad bowl model, where each distinct <laughs> culture is preserved. And our multicultural values is a salad dressing as an item of the American mix. Here, the tomato and the carrot are not called veggie soup. The tomato is called the tomato, and the carrot is called the carrot. Now, there's a Korean word um, pronounced carrot. It literally translates to chicken ribs in English. Um, however, in Korea, it is used as a metaphor for an entirely different meaning. It is like kalbi or pork ribs or chicken ribs or whatever you would like to call with very little meat. Now, you do not want to eat this because you're going to get so little meat for all the effort and time you put. But at the same time, you do not want it to end up in your, end up in your dog's mouth. Now, you would eat it instead. So as in this example, gerek is something that one hesitates to give up, though they have little interest. Now, the closest English equivalents I can think of are like leftovers or scrap. But they mean something that is not needed, whereas gerek means something that is still of little worth. And because of these imperfect cultural translations, we need multicultural competence. And so when we learn about other cultures, or when we explain our culture to others, we normally make analogies. And although similarities might exist, yet they aren't identical. And this means we can't fully understand other cultures through indirect experiences. Therefore, we're required to be tolerant about the aspects that we can't fully understand and be skillful in interpreting them. And recently, I've been participating in the after-school club Model United Nations. Um, having, and I also have a hobby in literature. I've been working for the school newspaper. And all three activities are ways of opening windows to other people's lives. Um, Model UN is a simulation of the United Nations General Assembly. It is a forum where all the member states of the United Nations can um, discuss about their, uh, their issues of interest. This year, I chose China. And by choosing China, I was, I, was, I was able to push myself from just being tolerant. There is such a country like China that's so different from South Korea and the United States to really understanding their history and their values and their political ideology. Um, and also in literature, uh, there's a genre called Hawaiian local literature, which talks about Hawaii and is written by Hawaiian authors. Um, this novel, it's titled Three Years on Doreen Sofa by Lee Kataluna, is, um, is a, it depicts the impoverished Hawaii, which I have ever only heard of but never knew. And by interviewing the author, Lee Kataluna, and Eric Chalk of Bamboo Ridge, which, who is the, uh, which is a publish, I mean, is the editor of the publisher, I've been able to learn that literature can be a powerful tool in fostering multicultural competence. And also, besides these two people, I have chances to meet other various peoples. And by listening to them and interviewing them, I've been able to realize that I mean, I've, been able to, I was, I've been able to be exposed to differences and widen my perspectives. And I've also recent, um, recently took the SAT since I'm a junior and I should now start for my college applications. Um, and I noticed something very interesting about its essay section. We might think that it requires students to not just be critical thinkers, I mean, not just be fast writers, but critical thinkers as well. But I figure that it's actually, it only requires students to be definitive on a singular viewpoint. I was asked to write whether changes were good or bad. Uh, it never asked me to write how the same change could be good to some and bad to others, depending on their own perspectives. And this can be very, un this can be unfair for multicultural people like me, because we're naturally grown up, we're trained to take multiple approaches on the same issue based on different perspectives. So by saying multicultural competence, I mean that it is not about becoming more precise but it is becoming more skillful in making analogies and explaining the differences. And I learned all of this by being forced to live in Austin, Texas at the age of five. <laughs> now, until then, I was raised by my Korean grandmother. And I still remember crying to my parents, oh, I want to stay with grandma, I don't want to leave. And, you know, there's not much a five-year-old can do. So when I crossed the border into Austin, Texas at the age of five, I could clearly see that I was different. Everyone was white and emitted noises which I couldn't understand. Uh, this, <laughs> this is a picture from third grade. And I'm that very weird Asian boy who 
has big eyes and a nice smile and you know, clearly looks different from all his white friends. So in a globalized world where there are so many different ideologies, it is really hard for me to discern right from wrong. And in such environment, I believe that it is not only inappropriate but impossible to suggest, hey, you do your thing and I'll do my thing and life will be nice. I mean, all cultures do deserve respect in that they're developed in a way that fits their people and their environment the best. And the discrepancies among cultures are so great that they're incompatible. It is difficult to judge whether one culture is superior to another or inferior to others. And so personally, I would like to reserve judgments. But in reality, I can't and we can't. So if we have to make judgments about other cultures, why isn't tolerance enough? Globalization increasingly means that the world is flat, as Thomas Friedman put it. Cultures can't be separated, and international exchanges will increase even more than right now. When the American and Korean culture come in conflict, when they collide, decisions have to be made. And they can be made unskillfully and skillfully. What I saw in Austin, Texas was tolerance of people imagining that one day that all the cultures will somehow melt into one happy average. In Honolulu, Hawaii, what I see is confidence. People participate in more than one culture, learn and imagine about other perspectives. It is where the tomato and carrot can sit in the same classroom and say, hi tomato and hi carrot, I'm not saying hi veggie soup. So tolerance is just being nice. It is hiding away from making judgments. Competence, on the other hand, is being skillful. And by being more than just tolerant, we can be skillful in understanding other cultures and negotiating for common values and interests. We need to accept that we're living in a world of cultural contradictions. We have to cope with differences. And to do this, as I said, tolerance is not enough. We have to be aware of the different cultures, the different values that are outside. And, it, and, and we have to not just be aware of them. We have to understand how they can be rational and reasonable from the perspectives of their own native context. I think that bicultural and multicultural people make America stronger. It is because they, the U.S. can get insider information on all of the countries it deals with because it has people that understand both sides of the fence. Now, Hawaii is the microcosm of the world and there are so many cultures that commingle here. It is also the salad bowl, where the tomato, the cheese, the carrot, the lettuce don't stand up by themselves, but are in a state of harmony and blended by the salad dressing, multicultural competence. Now, what would happen if the salad dressing says, if all the ingredients say, hey, I want to stand up by myself and get rid of the salad dressing. Oh, what would happen to our world if the growing generations aren't multiculturally competent, if they aren't willing to understand others and in return prevent others to understand them? Now, by now, many of you might wonder why the title of my this TED talk is fostering multicultural competence through education. Because I have never really said anything about being a methods of being educated. It is because I have learned to become multiculturally competent through the people I've met, the places I've been, and the relationships that I've formed. My education did not take place in the traditional classroom. It was done outside in the real world through life experiences. I am Korean but I dance. Thank you. <laughs>